It is my pleasure with that to welcome Dr. Gordas to our podium. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Good evening to all of you. Thank you to the entire Fuchs Mitzraki community for the gracious invitation to be here with you this evening. Uh, I flew in from Israel this morning, and I'm going to go back tomorrow so I can vote. And uh, a number of you began by uh, asking me, first of all, what's going to happen, and B, who am I going to vote for? So before we get to that, before I perhaps ruffle your feathers, I want to tell you that part of the extraordinary delight about being here this evening is that even as far away in Israel, the Fuchs Mizrahi School in Cleveland has really an extraordinary reputation. It was a number of years ago when I worked for the Mandel Foundation that I began to come to Cleveland on a regular basis and first became exposed to the extraordinary work that you do. Uh, but now that I'm no longer coming to Cleveland quite as often, it really doesn't make any difference in how much you hear about Fuchs Mizrahi. Whether you're in Cleveland or New York or Jerusalem, what you are building here has literally an international reputation for excellence, for commitment to Tzionut and Bedinat Israel. And for those reasons and many more, it is truly a great honor for me to be here with you tonight, and I thank you very much for the invitation. So back to the election. I learned a couple of things in the um, little reception hanging out before. So some people did actually come up and ask me, so who are you going to vote for? And from this, I learned that Israel is exporting not only high-tech, but its sense of social mores. And uh, <laughs> Americans are not quite what they used to be, thanks both to our microprocessors and our deep sense of social etiquette. So I am not going to tell you who I am going to vote for. It just seems to be kind of not your business. <laughs> but uh, some people have also asked me, so what do you think is going to happen? And as you all well know, the Gemara says that after Chagai Zacharia and Malachi, uh, the, top, the, 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 the task of uh, prophecy was given to children and to fools. Since tragically when I look in the mirror, I know that I'm no longer a child, there's only one other option, and therefore I am also not going to predict uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. But I can share with you one piece of secret information that um, you do not yet have. And that is that it is now, let's see, it is about uh, 2.15 in the morning Israel time. So my guess would be that Bibi Netanyahu has just recently crawled into bed exhausted, and I can guarantee you the last thing he said to Sarah before he dozed off was, why in the world did I call these elections? Uh, so what's going to happen on Tuesday, I don't know, but all you can be sure of the fact is he's sorry that there is an election on Tuesday. It remains to be seen what's going to happen. It's actually a pivotal, a very pivotal, I think, election for Israelis in a number of ways. Uh, but we're not going to we're not going to talk about that tonight. I want to talk about the fact that there's a state to have elections in the first place, and about the fact that you or I actually don't even think of the miraculousness of that anymore. We take the fact that Israel is a democracy entirely for granted, even though the vast majority of people who move to Israel, the 700,000 Jews from North Africa, a million Jews from the former Soviet Union, some number of Jews from North America, 98% of them from Cleveland. <laughs> With the exception of the ones from Cleveland, those people from North Africa, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, the Soviet Union, the vast majority of people who came to Israel over the course of the last 65 years came from countries in which there was absolutely no democratic tradition. And yet Israel has simply had a functioning democracy, not only from the beginning of the state, and not only in the Yeshuv which preceded it, but from the very first Zionist Congress in 1897, and from the second Zionist Congress in 1898 when women were allowed to both vote and run to become delegates long before any other major European parliament did anything remotely similar. We take all of that completely for granted. We take for granted the fact that there's a state, though we shouldn't. Because the existence of the State of Israel is actually one of the grandest stories of human accomplishment in the story of all mankind. It is actually extraordinary to think about what has been built by a small people oppressed in Europe for hundreds of years, largely powerless, then attacked in Europe, 
ignored and then repelled by the Ottomans and betrayed by the British, exterminated by the Germans. What's been built in a very small place over a very small period of time. In 1897 in Basel, after the first Zionist Congress, Theodor Herzl, as many of you know, returned to his hotel room and wrote in his diary, today I created the Jewish state. And then he added, as if in a footnote, if I were to say that out loud, people would laugh. But it will happen in five years or ten years, but certainly no more than 50 years from now. The Jews will have a state, he said, in 1897. And it was in 1947, exactly 50 years later, that the General Assembly voted on November 29th to partition what was then called Palestine and to create a Jewish state. Herzl was exactly right. He was right that it would happen, and he got the timing right, he was right, in a sense, that in 1897, he actually created the Jewish state. The problem with the security of the state of Israel, which of course needs to be protected vigilantly at all times, but the problem with the security and the robustness and the vitality of the Jewish state is that we forget very often how extraordinary its creation was. And what I'd like to do tonight is to think with you a little bit about what it was that enabled that to happen. How was it that in the space of those 50 years between 1897 and 1947, 48, a period of time in which the world fought two world wars, killed 100 million people, 60 million in World War II, which was 2.6% of the world's population, a third of the Jews in the world, 90% of Polish Jewry, which was the greatest Jewish community on earth at that time. What enabled this project called the Zionist Revolution to actually come to be? To focus the question a little bit more, I want to actually read you a list of people who were born in the space between 1849 and 1887 which is a very, very short period of time, less than 40 years. This is not an entire list of all the Jews born between 1849 and 1887. You will be glad to know. But the following people were born between Nordau's birth in 1849 and Beryl Katz Nelson's birth in 18, uh, 1887. Nordau in 1849, Aleph Dalid Gordon in 1856, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, the father of modern Hebrew in 1858, Theodor Herzl in 1860, Micha Berdachevsky in 1865, Achad Ha'am, the author of the idea of a spiritual Jewish center in 1865, Avraham Isaac Cook, the first rabbi of the state of Israel in 1865, Chaim Nachman Bialik, the poet laureate of the Jewish people who gave expression to the soul of an entire people in 1873, Chaim Weitzman, the first president of Israel in 1874, Vladimir Jabotinsky, the inventor of revisionist Zionism in 1881. Yosef Brenner, an Eloi in the yeshiva of Velazhin and a great writer in Zion early on in 1881. David Ben-Gurion in 1886. And Beryl Katz Nelson, Ben-Gurion's closest friend for the rest of his life in 1887. There are actually more. But that is an unbelievable list of people to be born in the space of 40 years. The number of ideas, the number of books and articles, the intellectual richness created by just those 13 people and many more we could point to if we had time, is actually, I would suggest to you, in the history of Zionism, never been duplicated. Arthur Hertzberg, as many of you know, wrote an extraordinary book called The Zionist Idea, the first 150 pages of which is really the best introduction to Zionist thought ever been written. It has been read by approximately six people. And the rest of the book is actually a compilation of the writings of many of the people that I just listed and many, many others. It's a big, thick book, probably six, 700 pages in length, put out originally by the Jewish Publication Society, and I believe still in print. But here's the question. If somebody were to come to one of us today 
in 2015 and say, I want to put out the second volume of the Zionist idea. And I want to include all the great Zionist ideas that have been written, say, since 1960 to 2015. You would not come up with anything nearly the size of what it was that Hertzberg put together. We have done extraordinary things since 1960. In six days, it, Israel tripled its size in six lightning days. Israel has contributed a tremendous amount to the world, technologically, musically, artistically, in a whole array of ways. There are a tremendous number of things that Israel has done, but if you were to try to put out the second volume of the Zionist idea, you would actually say that between 1960, let's just say as a random date, and 2015, the number of great ideas that you would add to Hertzberg's book is actually relatively small. We've done tremendous things since 1960, but not in the world of ideas. There are obvious exceptions, but by and large. So what I want to ask us to a certain extent tonight is, what was it that created that list of 13 people and many, many more, all born in the space of 39 or 40 years, that enabled that kind of richness and that kind of intellectual vitality to take root? And although we don't have time this evening to go through each of their own lives, even briefly, uh, tonight, uh, that's what Wikipedia is for, for you on the way home. If you were to look at them, the vast majority of them, not all, but the vast majority of them actually grew up in religious homes. Almost all of them. Some of them remained religious. Many of them did not. But even those who did not remain religious lived lives with a deep imprimatur of what it was that Jewish religious life had taught them till their very last day. Take Chaim Nachman Bialik, who also had been in Eloi at the Velazhen Yeshiva, a real Talmid Chacham, a person who grew up in his grandfather's home, deeply steeped in Torah learning, who though, while he ultimately became not as observant toward the rest of his life, though by the way, not as completely non-observant as many people suggest, a person who kept his love for learning and for Torah close to his heart. It was long after he had made that transformation that he and Rav Nitsky wrote together Sefer HaAgadah, which to this day remains one of the great compilations of rabbinic literature, bringing the majestic glory of rabbinic literature to a much wider audience than would have been possible. It's easy to say that Bialik was someone who grew up religious and ended up in Palestine not religious, but that's an oversimplification. He was a person who grew up in a small town in Eastern Europe, deeply marked by the Jewish religious tradition, and a person who stayed in love with that tradition until he passed away in 1934. David Ben-Gurion, perhaps the greatest embodiment of secular Zionism who stood on May 14, 1948, in what was then the Tel Aviv Museum, under a gigantic picture of Theodor Herzl with his head intentionally uncovered, just, by the way, as Herzl had stood in 1897 with his head intentionally uncovered. It's easy to say also that Ben-Gurion was the embodiment of secular Zionism at its greatest, and to a certain extent that's true. But Ben-Gurion had also grown up in a religious home. Ben-Gurion had also grown up with the Bible as his literal companion. Ben-Gurion also grew up forever touched by what it was that that early childhood had bequeathed him. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that so many of these 13 people and dozens and dozens more we didn't list tonight grew up in religious homes? What is their having grown up in religious homes have to do at all with the intellectual and ideological vitality of the Zionist movement in its early phase? I want to suggest to you that in addition to so many other things, which we're, of course we're not going to go into tonight, one of the many things that that religious world bequeathed to them was a sense that Jewish life was living one's life inside a narrative. Being Jewish was not something that we did. Being Jewish was simply what we are. 
living a life of traditional Jewish life, leaving aside for a moment the theological categories of mitzvah and commandedness and the ribono shalom, which are critically important to most of us in this room, but were not as critically important to those people. They understood on a certain level, both implicitly and explicitly, because of the way that they had been raised, that to be a Jew meant to live your life in a story, inside a story. To be a Jew meant to mourn a building that you had never seen. It meant that from Asara B'tevet, through Shivasar Batamuz and culminating in Tisha B'Av, you went through a progression of increased anxiety, worry, and finally devastation to the point that you would sit on the floor and you would not eat and you would not drink and you would literally weep over a building you'd never ever seen. We read the Torah year in and year out and just as we are about to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land, we stop. And as you well know, we go back to the beginning. Never reading the book of Joshua as part of that cycle, but always ending with Moshe Rabbeinu's last bracha to Bnei Yisrael, and then going back to the creation of the world, communicating to us that Jewish life is about yearning. That Jewish life is not about getting there, Jewish life is always about struggling to get there. What Achad Ha'am and Bialik and Ben Gurion and Katz Nelson and Aleph Dalit Gordon and so many of those people had intuited because they grew up with the cycle of the Torah reading was that to be a Jew meant to struggle to make something come to life. You had dreams that you weren't sure you would ever see realized, but you sang those dreams week in and week out. You might have been born in a small town in Poland. You might have been born in Odessa. You might have been born anywhere in that part of the world, and you might have been poor. And you might have known deep down that you would never live to see Eretz HaKodesh, but you would still say every Shabbat morning in the Shacharit Kedusha, Matai timloch b'tzion b'karov b'yameinu le'olam va'ed tishkon. When will you dwell in Zion? When will the dream come true? What it meant to be Jewish, even if you were poor, even if you were in the pale of settlement, even if your feet would never, ever, ever touch the ground of Eretz Israel, meant to be part of a larger story. To understand that you were not living just in a town, whether it was Vilajin, or it was Minsk, or it was Odessa, or it was Cleveland. What it meant to be a Jew was not simply to live somewhere, to be, be part of a greater story. All of those 13 people and the many hundreds of others who made the Jewish state a possibility grew up in a religious world which communicated to them that to be Jewish is to be part of a story. To be Jewish is not just simply to be an individual or to be a member of a certain community, but it is to be part of a people that has yearned and longed, not for hundreds, but for thousands of years. But we'd had that for a long time. So what changed in 1880 and in 1890 and in 1900? What changed between 1897 when Herzl gathered those people together in Basel and 1948 when Ben-Gurion gathered people together in Tel Aviv. What changed was, to a large extent, that those Jews who'd grown up in those small little towns actually began to venture outward. They encountered not only the religious tradition of their ancestors, but they encountered the extraordinary culture that was becoming Europe. They saw it through the secular enlightenment, and they saw it through the Jewish Haskalah. And it was not what Huntington would call a clash of civilizations. It was actually an enrichment of civilizations. What was particularly 
rich about that period of Jewish life was that Jews lived in a tension between the traditional world in which they had been raised and the intellectual world of the West, which they didn't buy entirely, but they certainly found extraordinarily compelling in many, many ways. Avraham Avinu says to Bnei Chet, the children of Chet, when it's time to bury Sarah, and he goes to buy Me'arat HaMachpelah, Ger v'toshav anochi imachem. I am both a stranger and a dweller in your midst. Now most of the Mepharshim on that parsha talk about the fact that he actually had just moved to the area and therefore did not own a burial land, and that's what he meant by Ger v'toshav. I live here now, but I wasn't always here, so I don't have a place to bury my wife, so I want to buy the cave. But Rabbi Soloveitchik, the Rav, points out that we can understand Ger v'toshav anochi imachem in a somewhat different way. The Rav said that when Avraham Avinu says, Ger v'toshav anochi imachem, I am both a dweller and a stranger in your midst, that what we should understand is that we are both people of this world and people of another world at the same time. And perhaps we can actually push that just a little bit further in a different direction and to say that when Avraham Avinu said to Bnei Chet, Ger v'toshav anochi imachem, he was pointing to precisely what made Jewish life so rich in the latter years of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. I am a stranger to this Western, secularized, intellectually rich world, but not an entire stranger. I also live in it. Ben Gurion, born in a little town and attracted by the Enlightenment. Bialik, born in a small Jewish shtetl, overwhelmed and overcome by the Haskalah. And one could go on and on and on. What all of those people had in common was that they had taken in from their earliest days a sense of Jewishness, which was being part of a story. But they had also been exposed to the larger Western world, a world that made them dream of much bigger things. A world that exposed them to the idea of nationalism. A world that exposed them to the revolutions taking over Europe, first in the West and then in the East, and therefore that said to them, if they can have revolutions, we can have revolutions too. It was a world that said that we want to live inside a narrative, but that narrative can also be enriched by the larger world in which we exist. The Midrash Rabbah on Echa says, Famously, if someone asks you if there is Torah among the Gentiles, then you should say no. You should not believe them. But if someone says to you that there is wisdom among the Gentiles, then of course the answer is that there is. That there is what to learn from people who are like us, and there's a tremendous amount to learn from people who are very much not like us. That's in fact the magic of cutting-edge Jewish education a hundred years later. Part of the reason that we actually couldn't fill that second volume of Arthur Hertzberg's book is that not enough Jewish people are being raised with that incredibly fruitful meeting, not a clash, but that fruitful meeting between two not competing but mutually enriching civilizations. When those Jews of Eastern Europe ventured out from the shtetl and encountered both the Enlightenment and the Haskalah, they experienced that. When Jewish people 2,000 years ago and even more began to encounter the Greco-Roman world, we got in large measure Sifrut Chazal. We got the literature of our rabbis. Too many Jews today, though, have picked one side or the other on which to live. And it is, by the way, true in Israel as well as it is true in the United States. There are those people who are actually being raised to understand that to be a Jew is to live inside a story. To be a Jew is to see yourself as part of an ancient history of having a home, of exile and praying to return, but who live that life without any meaningful encounter of civilizations outside their Jewish world. And there are many more Jews 
in the United States, but also in Israel, who live their lives as part of the Western world, but a Western world which imbues them with the notion that they are fundamentally individuals, that a life well and richly lived is about doing well for themselves, for their families, for a small circle around them, without any sense that at the very same time, life is also about being part of that rich tapestry of thousands of years, part of that tension between the West and the Jewish, the modern and the ancient, the individual and the collective. That tension is never easy. That tension is not entirely comfortable. But I would suggest to you that the purpose of Jewish life was never to make us comfortable. The purpose of Jewish life was always to challenge us to be greater. A British poet and philosopher once said that it was the greatness of the Greek philosopher to make the Greeks feel at home anywhere in the world. And it was the greatness of the Hebrew prophet to make the Jew uncomfortable even in Jerusalem. We don't aspire to be comfortable. We don't seek to avoid intellectual tension and the richness that comes with it. It is not our goal to make life a life in which all of the questions have easy answers, in which all of the challenges are deftly thwarted. That is an attraction for some people. It's just not our way. Chazal left us the rich tradition that it did because they were both horribly critical of the world of the Romans and deeply respectful of some of its intellectual insights. Those great sages of early Zionism in the late 1800s and the early 1900s left us a rich ideological Zionist tradition because they too lived in both worlds. They did not by any means buy everything they saw in the Western world, but they knew other kinds of wisdom when they saw it. They could be inspired by revolution when they learned about it. They could appreciate the wisdom and the idea of nationalism when they witnessed what it could do. And they could take that and they could marry that to thousands of years of Jewish tradition and in the space of literally half a century, which is a blink in the eye of human history, transform Jews from a people who lived at the behest of their hosts in the pale of settlement to Jews who could, do, Jews who could defend themselves in Eretz Israel, beginning on May 14th, 1948, all the way until this very day. This past Wednesday, I sat in a Talmud Shir, which may not strike you as being terribly interesting, though it was actually a great Shir. But what was particularly interesting about the Shir that I sat in, which was actually a class at Shalem College, where I work in Jerusalem, was that it was taught by a woman who is the daughter of a Rav from Bnei Brak. She's one of, I don't know exactly how many children, seven, nine, eleven, a, a lot of children. And her father taught the girls Gemara on Shabbos afternoon. And this one daughter fell in love with the study of Talmud and is now one of Israel's widely recognized phenomenal Talmud teachers. And a lawyer, and a PhD, and a mother, and so on and so forth. And she taught a class on Wednesday morning to a group of Shalem students, some of whom were boys sitting in Kippot, who were now in college after years in Hezder in the army, and some of whom were girls who had never seen a page of Talmud before. It was a class composed of people who'd spent 15 years of their lives studying Talmud, and a class composed of people who a couple of weeks ago at the start of the second semester had literally never seen a page of Talmud. And it was a sugya from the tractate of Gitin about Mipnei Darchei Shalom, things that we do, all sorts of different kinds of laws that we have because we want to further the paths of peace. And I sat on the outside of this shiur and I watched people who had studied this sugya time and time and time again since they were probably in the seventh grade. 
listen to men and women who had never seen it before last week and say out loud, I never thought about it that way. I watched them read the sugya in Masechet Gitin, and then as the professor took out, this was a sugya about who has rights to water from the river because of where they're situated on a hill, who then took out a couple of pages of Israel's national law about water rights, showing them how much of the language in Israel's natural law, national law actually parallels what's found in the Gemara. Religious and secular, experienced and brand new, men and women, they sat there huddled around a Jewish text talking about what's fair and what's right and what's just and looked at Israel's contemporary law and saw its link to the Talmud and understood that to be a Jew, to be an Israeli, is to be part of an ongoing story which is enriched by an encounter with people who didn't always understand themselves that way. That's also the glory of what happens at the Fuchs Mizrahi School. This kind of education, which is more Zionist probably than any other day school in the United States of America or Canada, coupled with the very, very best education in all fields of secular learning, seeks, it seems to me, to recapture precisely what it was that made that generation of Zionist thinkers about a hundred years ago so incredibly vital. To have your children, to have your grandchildren, to have your students understand just what they understood a hundred years ago. And just what they understood 2,000 years ago. When they decided that even if the people who recited Birkat Hamazon might never see Eretz Israel, every time they thanked God for bread, they would say, Bone Berachamav, Yerushalayim, Amen. They said to themselves, there may come a day in the middle of the 21st century when people will sit in Cleveland and they'll eat bread that was made from grain grown in Iowa. But when they thank God for that bread, they will mention not Cleveland. And they will mention not Iowa. But they will say, Bone berachamav, Yerushalayim, Amen. Because to be a Jew is to live inside a story. And because they study here, your children understand that. Your grandchildren understand that. Your students understand that. They understand that what it means to be a Jew at its very best, at its very richest, is not to seek the easy answer, is not to seek a life devoid of questions, is not to seek a life in which there is no tension at all between civilizations. It is, in fact, precisely the opposite. It is to take the richness of Jewish life and our absolute commitment to it and the very best of the intellectual world of the West and to live a complicated, nuanced life trying to synthesize the two. That was part of the greatness of the world of Chazal. That was unquestionably part of the greatness of the world of those people that I mentioned to you between 1880 approximately and 1920. And that I would suggest to you was the extraordinary model of Jewish religious and intellectual life, which all of you, by virtue of being here tonight, make possible to the community of learners that is called the Fuchs Mizrahi School. Now I said to you at the beginning of our evening that I wasn't going to say anything about the elections, but I'm Israeli, so you'll have to give, forgive me if I come back to the elections. I don't want to get into who's going to win, because I don't know. And I don't want to get into who I'm going to vote for. I'm not sure I know that either. But I do want to say something about Buzi Herzog, who is giving our prime minister an unexpected run for his money. He may win, he may not win. 
He may get the most votes in the Knesset and not be able to put together a coalition. You may love him, you may not love him. You may hope this, you may hope that. Let's put that all aside tonight. Let's just remember who he is. Just because he's a reflection of exactly what we're talking about tonight. He is the grandson of another Yitzchak Herzog, Yitzchak Halevi Herzog, former chief rabbi of the state of Israel, who also got a PhD from the University of London. This is not to endorse Herzog, it's not to criticize Herzog, it's not to say anything about his candidacy except to say that it's not an accident that some of the greatest and most committed leaders of Israel, whose views you may like, whose views you may not like, are actually products of exactly what Yitzhak Halevi Herzog Zichronoli Vracha represented, a Talmid Chacham of extraordinary proportion, who also had a PhD from the University of London, who was the important Zionist figure, by the way, born in 1888, exactly the year after Beryl Katznelson. He's exactly one year after that gap of people that I mentioned to you, who strove in his life to combine the richness of the Jewish world and the intellectual sophistication of the West when he thought it had what to add. It's therefore not at all an accident, and it's not at all surprising that his son became a leader of the Jewish state and that his grandson would be following in that tradition, again, regardless of what any of us in this room particularly think of his views, that kind of richness, that kind of mixing and matching of, of civilizations is precisely what creates the richness that we need in order to guarantee the future of the Jewish people. Whatever happens in Israel this coming week, Israel will march on. Our subject tonight is not really Israeli politics. Our subject tonight is what has made Jewishness great throughout the years. What have been the hallmarks and the characteristics of those periods of Jewish life which have been the intellectually most interesting, the culturally most vibrant, the Jewishly most committed, and whether it was the period of Chazal or the period of these Zionist ideologues as different as those two periods were and as different as those leaders clearly were, what they had in common, I believe, was a recognition of that narrative that makes the Jewish people who we are, a people who knew that we had a homeland, a people who were exiled from it time and time again, but never, ever, ever left it willingly and always dreamt of going home. And at the same time, a people who chose to communicate that idea to their children and their grandchildren and their students, not by hiding them from the world around them, but by exposing them consciously and intentionally to the riches of the world around them. That is what has made Jewishness great at certain pivotal periods of our history. And that, I would suggest to you, is precisely what is going to continue to make Judaism great in the future. And because that is precisely the model of education that is at the heart of this extraordinary school, you are, it seems to me, doing much more than offering your students a great education. You are actually modeling to them what an extraordinarily rich, committed, and open Jewish life can be. You are modeling to them the very, very best that Yiddishkeit has the capacity to be, the way in which Yiddishkeit has the capacity to shape them, to transform them, and to continue for many generations to come. Because what you are doing here is so extraordinary. Because what you are doing here, it seems to me, echoes the era of Chazal and echoes the extraordinary generation of Zionist thinkers who made possible but the not Israel to which you are so committed seems to me that you embody the very best of what the Jewish people has been, the very best of what the Jewish people is, and God willing, the very best of what the Jewish people will continue to be for many, many, many generations to come. Alu v'hatzlichu.
Thanks very much.